Uh, first of all, please let me know if you can see the pres presentation well. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, expression vector design and cell line engineering strategies to improve recombinant protein production. Uh, as my work is directly related to this field, uh, I work for a biotechnology, um, for the biotechnology department at the pharmaceutical company Urea Farm, and uh, actually uh, vector design this is my major uh, part, of, part of my work. Uh, and today I would like to uh, share some uh, experience that we have in this field and also dig a little bit deeper into uh, the literature data uh, concerning uh, expression vector design and uh, engineering strategies. Uh, I uh, intentionally compare uh, vector engineering with uh, playing with Lego blocks uh, just when you think of a, uh, an expression vector, you imagine that it consists of uh, specific functional parts and they have, be, have to be organized in a specific order uh, in order to provide uh, proper uh, protein expression. And this is the case, um, uh, for example, when you try playing with Lego and build a train uh, with, uh, as each train has to have its own locomotive, um, for example, a cargo car or a passenger uh, carriage, uh, depending on what, on what your train is actually doing uh, and carrying. Um, so you can compare that putting your locomotive in a wrong right or maybe using a wrong type of platform will not make your cars go. Uh, that's the case with uh, vector engineering strategies because if you use uh, a functional part that is not active, for example, in your cell line, or uh, if you put it in a wrong place in the vector, everything will go wrong and there will be no protein. Uh, but going back, oh, sorry, this is a disclaimer. Uh, going to the recombinant protein production. Actually, at the time of their first discovery, uh, 30 years ago, um, exactly molecular, uh, monoclonal antibodies became a groundbreaking uh, technology that promised to treat diseases and conditions that previously were considered unapproachable. And the demand for biologic has been growing rapidly since the 1990s. Uh, with an increasing number of disorders that are tackled by this uh, therapeutic modality. Uh, the number of FDA approved by pharmaceuticals has been steadily increasing uh, with, say, um, teams of uh, drugs registered in 2014-15 uh, uh, and uh, in 2021 it was 55 drugs already uh, per year and Consequently, we are observing a shift in focus from small molecule drugs to biologics, uh, with 37% of uh, drugs, new registered drugs, uh, under a biological license application in 2021. This is speaking about FDA uh, registrations. Uh, and uh, among recombinant protein-based uh, therapeutics, uh, monoclonal antibodies still comprise the dominant group. Uh, actually, about 50% of uh, recombinant proteins uh, are monoclonal antibodies or their fragments or derivatives. Uh, in 2021, FDA registered its uh, 100th uh, and monoclonal antibody as a drug. And we can see that uh, these products are large, largely used for treatments of uh, cancer, uh, hematologic diseases, infectious diseases, uh, immune disorders. Um, and actually the, the potential of their application is very large. Uh, 
to meet the growing market demand for recombinant protein uh, production, the biotech companies uh, focus their efforts on production uh, process optimization for higher stability, uh, quality compliance with regulatory requirements, and of course, uh, lower production costs. Uh, so what are the factors affecting protein yields? Actually, they are numerals and can include expression system type that we're using, the expression vector configuration, the transgene integration site, uh, transgene copy number, cell culture parameters, and the production process characteristics itself. So in today's lecture, I will cover um, major vector engineering approaches and will stop uh, in more detail on seamless assembly methods. Uh, I will also talk about uh, vector configuration engineering, and this is where uh, fun functional module assays are important. And uh, the last part will be about targeted integration approaches. Uh, which also uh, unable to increase therapeutic protein yields. Um, so when we're planning a protein expression experiment, the first question we have to ask ourselves is which expression system uh, we're going to use, because it defines the very basic characteristic of both the vector design and the production process. Uh, in order to be suitable for a biopharmaceutical application, a cell line has to be able to support high production of protein. It has to be stable, uh, stable for expression over long periods of time. Uh, it has to uh, ensure appropriate uh, post-translational modifications. And in case of uh, antibodies, this is a very important part. Uh, and of course, a cell line has to comply with uh, human safety standards. Uh, without that, any product will not be uh, uh, registered. So while protein expression may be efficiently carried in uh, different system in systems, including bacterial, yeast, and uh, mammalian cell cultures, uh, the choice of uh, expression system heavily depends on the nature of the protein itself. So uh, recombinant antibodies are highly complex molecules that uh, very much uh, depend on uh, their proper folding, correct cleavage, and specific post-translational modifications. Uh, so their production is performed uh, in mammalian cell culture and the, C, uh, the Chinese hamster ovary cell lines uh, are mostly uh, the cell lines of choice. Uh, this is because they are not susceptible to human viruses such as HIV and influenza and polio. Uh, they are relatively easy to manipulate and they're uh, pretty, let's say, um, not very easy, but relatively easy uh, uh, to uh, genetically uh, modify. Uh, and they produce high titers of antibodies. So that's why it's most often the cell line of choice. Uh, expression vector configuration is the first parameter that can be modified to enhance protein production. And essentially, uh, every functional component present in uh, in the vector can be uh, optimized. Um, promoters, um, internal no ribosome entry sites, which also influence uh, the protein uh, expression levels, introns, uh, uh, COSAC sequences, uh, terminators, uh, they are all very important for uh, optimizing the uh, protein uh, transcription and translation. Also, the gene of interest um, codon, uh, the gene of interest uh, amino acid sequence can be codon optimized uh, actually to uh, suit the preferences cell line that is used. Uh, and 
uh, signal peptides. This will be uh, one large part of uh, my lecture because uh, they, uh, it's not only about uh, transcription and, and translation, it's also about uh, proper secretion of a peptide that uh, really can uh, increase the amount of protein uh, that the protein yields. Uh, and uh, chromatin modifying elements are very important because these are the sequences uh, such as universal uh, chromatin opening elements uh, that keep to uh, keep chromatin region that contains the insert open uh, and uh, matrix attachment regions which reduce the silencing of the transgene. Uh, these are the options that we have beyond the actual functional elements in the um, protein expression cassette that can be also modified. Um, in our lab, uh, we work with uh, therapeutic monoclonal antibody production in uh, CHODG44 cell line. And our team has aimed to test various components uh, of expression vector to see how they determine uh, the protein yields. Uh, however, when we started this work, we understood that testing different um, sets of functional parts would require to uh, generate many uh, expression vectors of different uh, composition. And this is a very time consuming uh, part of work. So uh, first, uh, we, we sought for a assembly method that would be easy and uh, less time and effort consuming letting us to uh, measures of uh, various length and various amount of uh, functional parts uh, in the shortest time. Uh, well, there are several seamless cloning methods that are generally used for expression vector generation, and um, you're probably familiar with uh, Gibson assembly. Uh, there is also a recombination-based uh, sequence and ligation-independent cloning and uh, Golden Gate cloning. Uh, in our lab, we actually ended up using the Golden Gate cloning method which is uh, based on uh, type 2S restriction enzyme. Uh, the beauty of this enzyme is that it actually recognizes uh, one uh, part of the sequence, but leaves outside of the sequence. And this allows us to uh, design any type of overhang uh, that we have to attach to a functional part that we are going to uh, use for uh, for any uh, setup of cloning. Uh, the uh, advantages of these uh, of this method are um, that you can perform uh, ligation of uh, multi multiple uh, vector parts in one reaction in one test tube. Uh, the overhang is very short; it's only four nucleotides, so you get less unwanted uh, insertions uh, as a result of some uh, error cloning errors. And uh, this is actually this actually can be the case with uh, Gibson assembly because it uses much longer and cohesive uh, sequences. Uh, it's possible to ligate even very short functional parts, uh, including tags. And this is also an important uh, remark because uh, very short sequences, you can really uh, uh, do PCR with them, or even uh, if they contain some repetitive sequences or are uh, GC rich, this also make, makes PCR reaction. Uh, quite hard to handle. So that's another advantage. And um, this system is very simple to expand. And uh, I will show you uh, it on the example of uh, our own uh, in-house designed uh, vector assembly platform. Uh, we 
wanted to ensure rapid assembly of uh, multi-systronic plasmids containing up to 20 structural parts. So we developed a two-step golden gate assembly method that is facilitated by um, two type 2S restriction enzymes. It's AAR1 and BPI1. Uh, and we also generated a set of uh, recipient plasmids for two-step assembly of, of very long vectors. Uh, so here you can see that each type of uh, functional module is uh, flanked with uh, its specific on three prime end. Uh, and also on each end, there is an AAR1 site attached which enables these overhangs. Uh, we actually designed uh, this as a Lego block. So you can see that uh, the overhangs uh, on uh, five prime uh, end of one uh, functional part, functional module uh, match actually the overhang on the three prime end of the previous module. And this makes a consecutive uh, assembly possible. Uh, however, um, it's obvious when you have a multi-systronic vector, uh, a problem arises with the fact that in each cassette of the vector, there will be its own promoter, its own, for instance, uh, signal sequence or its own um, Fourier signal. And they will have the same uh, overhang uh, uh, sets uh, so ligation uh, in one test tube would not be possible because the overhangs will be competing and in the end result, uh, you will not get the proper organization of your vector. Uh, so uh, this problem can be uh, uh, solved with the use of recipient plasmids. Uh, in our case, the recipient plasmids uh, carried uh, AAR1 and BPI uh, sites uh, facing each other on each um, side of the recipient vector and uh, at an overhang uh, was shared between the AAR1 and BPI site. Uh, so this allowed us to pre-assemble some part of uh, a multisystronic vector uh, by uh, AAR1 cloning and uh, in this case, you actually can see that uh, the recipient plasmid AF included this part from A to F here. Uh, the next recipient plasmid was FE, and so this means that in the next cassette, uh, it included uh, the part from F to the next uh, E overhang on the uh, second cassette. And the third recipient plasmid, EH, uh, actually included the E to H part of the vector. Uh, when these uh, recipient plasmids are pre-assembled uh, with uh, their the, the uh, target sequences, uh, they can be cut again uh, by PPI uh, restriction enzyme and ligated into one uh, vector, uh, eventually carrying the two expression, uh, expression cassettes, uh, which are uh, assembled, assembled seamlessly. And actually, it all requires only two stages of cloning. Uh, so, in the next set of experiments, we aimed to evaluate how each individual uh, functional module affects protein expression in uh, CHO cell line. Uh, and we first constructed a uh, vector components library uh, that included promoters, introns, POSIX sequence, uh, signal peptide, COEA. Uh, this is not a full list because uh, we also have some other functional parts, but Today, I will just stop in more de detail on these ones. Uh, and the first set of uh, functional modules that we tested was promoters. Uh, obviously, a promoter is like a locomotive for our train. You can use a steam uh, locomotive, or you can use a very efficient electric high-speed uh, locomotive. And 
that will uh, very much shorten the time of your traveling, for instance. And with promoter, this, this works kind of the same way. Uh, the commonly used promoters for recombinant protein production in mammalian systems can be uh, uh, viral promoters, eukaryotic uh, heterologous promoters, endogenous promoters, and synthetically designed promoters. Uh, they are characterized by different strength, uh, which is which you can see from the diagram here. Uh, this is a promoter assay. Uh, which was done in CHO cell culture uh, and most standard uh, promoters were uh, assessed. And you see this is a relative uh, expression difference uh, between the use of uh, different promoters and you see beta glomid and uh, ubiquitin C being the less efficient in comparison with others. Uh, also, uh, promoters Promoters are uh, cell line specific and their activity can vary in different cell lines. Um, they may be synthetically designed and uh, for instance, I uh, see in the uh, Supercore Promoter 2, the one we used uh, is a rationally designed promoter that contains four promoter, promoter motifs. Uh, uh, and According to the initial publication, it has a higher transcriptional activity in comparison with the conventional human CV promoter. Uh, but there is one big uh, disadvantage that viral promoters, for instance, are prone to epigenetic silencing. And uh, this is actually something that can be uh, modified by the use of uh, chromatin opening element uh, or, or the use of uh, matrix attachment regions that um, uh, reduce this effect. Uh, in our library, uh, this already is the result of our work. Uh, in our library, we used uh, four uh, CMV uh, promoter variants. It was human CMV, neuron CMV, red CMV, and uh, um, synthetic uh, supercorp promoter too. Uh, we also use the EF1 alpha promoter, uh, human EF1 alpha promoter, which is very often used for uh, transgene expression and shows uh, high efficiency. Uh, SV40 origin enhancer promoter is uh, also one of the most commonly used. Uh, its um, activity is much lower than, um, for, for example, HCMB promoter. However, it's very often used uh, to express selection marker uh, as this provides higher stringency of selection. Uh, and also we use a ubiquitin uh, promoter, which is uh, a heterologous promoter for a CHO cell line. Uh, it has been shown to be very active in mice. However, uh, for CHO, uh, this hunt for a slower uh, activity. And in our case, we wanted to test it, whether it's uh, possible to be used for selection marker um, expression as an alternative to uh, SV40. So as a result, you can see that uh, the MCMD promoter turned out to be the most efficient, which is actually uh, consistent with the results we saw in the uh, uh, publications. Uh, and EF1 alpha is almost the same efficiency. Uh, however, it's interesting that in our case, the HCMV promoter and the uh, Supercore promoter had pretty much the same uh, level of activity. And as expected, ubiquitin and SV40 promoters were the uh, most weak among those. Uh, so this is just uh, another reminder that promoters uh, can act differently in different expression systems, and that's why they have to be assayed each time you, you uh, use another uh, expression system. Well, uh, COSIC sequence. Uh, this may be obvious. Uh, COSIC sequence is a consecutive 
consensus sequence of six to nine uh, bases that are proximal to the uh, AUG uh, start codon, and it can influence the translation speed and uh, delay the movement of ribosomes to coding regions. And uh, there is a better uh, COSAC sequence, which reads the ACC AUGG with uh, the minus 3A and plus 4G being the important uh, nucleotides that have to be present in the sequence. And the reason why I'm stopping on this uh, is because uh, when we first worked on our um, monoclonal antibody expression uh, vector, uh, we actually optimized all the uh, functional parts and tested them in the uh, XPCHO cell line and uh, obtained some level of expression. Uh, but uh, when we transferred, uh, th this was a transient expression, when we transferred this uh, expression vector uh, and used it in, uh, for stable expression in uh, DG44 cell line, uh, we obtained zero product, really zero. So uh, the question was why, and it took us very long time to uh, solve the riddle. And as a result, uh, actually, it was reading the troubleshooting guide that helped because uh, in the manual to uh, DG44, it says that a COSAC sequence has to be always present uh, before the uh, start codon and we checked for our um, uh, sequence and it turned out that uh, COSAC there was uh, truncated so it was not full there. Uh, and okay, we replaced it with uh, the right one, the, the full sequence, and it turned out that in uh, XPCHO uh, it provided um, Compass uh, of proteins uh, as before. And uh, for DG44, uh, the titers went from zero to wow, we actually can see the protein here. Uh, this is what you, you can see here. Uh, so, of course, uh, it seems that we were not the first one, ones who missed this point uh, if uh, this was already shown in the manual that causal sequence is important. Uh, but still, uh, don't forget to check for it when you start uh, designing your vector. Uh, next, um, I'm, I'm not stopping on uh, introns or uh, uh, transcription termination signal, uh, just it will take too much time. So uh, I will just uh, talk a little bit about signal peptides uh, that are used in trans translocation of uh, protein, uh, of the transcribed protein from uh, and, and the cytosol to the lumen of endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, many sequences from uh, secreted proteins have been adopted for the secretion of uh, foreign proteins. Uh, they are very different, and uh, but still they all share some uh, kind of structural uh, similarity. Uh, and you can see that Basically, a signal of time uh, includes an N region, which is positively charged and is used for uh, interaction with the uh, signal recognition particle. Uh, the hydrophobic H region in the middle is used for anchoring of the uh, signal peptide in the membrane here. And uh, the C region uh, is the most proximal part to the uh, actual uh, peptide that's being secreted. Uh, this is where the uh, peptidase cleavage takes place. And uh, the proper cleavage of a signal peptide is highly important for uh, antibodies to obtain a full length, uh, properly folded uh, molecule. Uh, Natural peptides uh, derived from human albumin and azerol can be, are often used for uh, recombinant protein production. And here you can see uh, the signal peptide derived from human albumin that has been shown to um, 
uh, increase productivity of uh, a mob producing CHO cell line from uh, about less than 20 picograms per cell per day to almost 40 picograms per cell per day. Uh, this is a two times increase, and these uh, productivities are quite uh, high for uh, industrial protein production, which is very important. Uh, however, uh, the downside of the story about signal peptides is that uh, one shoe does not fit all. Uh, there is no universal signal peptide that can be used for any type of uh, uh, recombinant proteins that you want to make uh, to be secreted. Uh, you actually have to uh, optimize signal peptide for every single pro uh, protein product uh, and also think of the uh, expression system that you are using and the actual uh, amino acid content context of uh, the um, N-terminal region of the uh, antibody. And this has been shown, uh, for example, by the use, by the, by the assay of uh, signal peptides derived from um, natural human uh, antibodies. Uh, um, the uh, couple light chain for, uh, for, for the light chain antibody and uh, eight signal peptides for. Uh, uh, heavy chain uh, of the antibody were assayed uh, and uh, were actually, they were actually tested on uh, five, the most popular, let's say, uh, and monoclonal antibody uh, drugs present in the market. And it turned out that uh, the same uh, signal peptides would render different uh, uh, protein yields for different um, proteins that are uh, expressed. Uh, so we also tested uh, a library of signal peptides in our uh, lab, and it turned out that you can see that um, H7 was the less efficient antibody, while um, other uh, less, less efficient signal peptide, while others uh, actually um, produced pretty much the same levels of protein, uh, which can can indicate that maybe the the model uh, antibody that we are using is more uh, tolerant to different signal sequences, while other uh, uh, antibodies may not be the same. Uh, so to end the story about vector configuration optimization, uh, let's look at the final train architecture when we have actually uh, combined all the uh, locomotive and carriage parts together. Uh, there is evidence that excess of life chain uh, is beneficial for higher monoclonal antibody production. Uh, as it helps to decrease product aggregation. Uh, so to establish a proper uh, light chain, heavy chain ratio, uh, promoters of different strength may be used, uh, as well as uh, internal ribosome entry sites uh, are also used for, for this um, purpose. Uh, in our case, uh, we wanted to test uh, how individual promoter combinations uh, would influence the uh, LCH ratio. So we uh, expressed const constructs with uh, uh, three uh, cassettes of light chain, heavy chain, and uh, signal peptide. Uh, and what it turned out that um, the transcription of both light chain and heavy chain peptides from urine CMB promoter uh, in a trisostronic vector turned out to provide the highest protein yields, despite of our expectation that uh, a weaker promoter for a heavy chain would uh, render better LCHC ratio. So uh, this is just another proof that all these manipulations with vector optimizations were worth uh, the effort and in the result you, you get to, to this combination of different parts that 
uh, give you um, the optimal amount of protein that you're looking for. Uh, although uh, vector engineering is a critical part of any biotech R&D process, uh, this is not the only factor that influences protein production efficiency. Um, yes, we have already said that viral promoters can be uh, prone to epigenetic silencing. Uh, and yes, uh, different chromatin modifying elements can be used to um, overcome this problem, but this is not necessarily enough. Uh, and with this point, uh, I'll be moving to a question whether foraging acid can be integrated uh, uh, into a certain position in the host genome, whether it's a safe harbor that uh, ensures stable and efficient uh, transcription. Uh, without disrupting any cellular functions, or it's a hotspot that is prone to uh, high transcriptional activity and thus would provide higher protein yields. Uh, in general, a transgene cassette is integrated randomly into the cell genome, and thus it may be positioned in a transcriptionally uh, repressive locus. Uh, so in recent years, several approaches have been uh, adopted for uh, targeted integration of the gene of interest, and they include recombinase-based system, mostly pre-locks or FLP, FLT-based uh, systems. Uh, of course, nuclease DNA repair pathways and um, transposase-mediated integration. And um, I will stop briefly on the last one first. So um, you probably remember that uh, DNA transposons are repetitive genetic components that are found in eukaryotic uh, cells, and they consist of uh, a gene that is flanked by two inverted terminal repeats. Uh, so if um, you take your gene of interest and flank it by uh, the same inverted terminal repeats and uh, co-transfect the plasmid together with uh, a, a vector expressing a transposase, it mediates transposition of the gene uh, into um, several possible sites in the chromosome. And this method is uh, quite interesting for monoclonal antibody uh, expression uh, or cell line generation uh, because natural ozone signs are uh, sites are quite uh, are, are highly active so this would enable us to put the gene of interest into a, a spot on the genome that is uh, well transcribed uh, there are several publications proving that this technology increased the number of integrated gene copies. And in one case, here you can see that transposed clones had average um, of specific monoclonal antibody productivity of 26 picograms per cell per day, which is quite high. Uh, and um, the transposed cell line had an average of 5.4 copies per clone of the uh, transgene. Uh, as compared of 2.9 copies per clone uh, in case of standard transfection without the using of uh, trans transposition mediated integration. Um, this is an interesting uh, approach and we in our lab also uh, are trying to adapt it uh, for our vector, vector system, but the results are still preliminary. So. I will not go deep in, into those. Uh, when we think of a uh, high producing phone, it's easy to hypothesize that uh, it has integrated uh, the expression vector into a high transcriptional activity site. Uh, so why not try to introduce an alternative transgene into the same hotspot to ensure its official efficient expression. So say you found a very high producing clone and you want to use it for expression of some other protein too. Uh, 
uh, this strategy can be realized with the company's mediated cassette exchange method, um, which, as I already said, that is used with uh, free locks and FOP FRT recombinant systems. And I will stop on the free locks as this is uh, the one we have experience with. Uh, so CREA recombinase is a uh, vector of HP1 uh, derived enzyme which has been adopted for use in mammalian cells and it recognizes a 34 uh, nucleotide sequence that's termed LOX. Uh, this sequence has a uh, very um, determined uh, um, structure. Uh, it includes an uh, eight base player spacer and 13 base players uh, arms uh, that are uh, that actually include inverted repeats. Uh, so the exchange reaction uh, between uh, the lock sites can be controlled by uh, actually the spacer and the arms. Uh, of the sequence. The spacer determines the uh, specificity of recombination between the two lock sites and the arms determine uh, the stability of uh, insertion. So uh, if you mutate uh, the arms of a lock sequence, uh, uh, when recombination occurs between two uh, recombining uh, locks, uh, the resulting locks will render uh, inactive and uh, the uh, reverse reaction is not possible. Then. So uh, in this case, your insertion is stabilized in the genome, as you see here. Uh, the beauty of this method is that it allows to control the number of uh, transgene that you are uh, in inserting besides the, the uh, uh, target sequence where you're inserting, it's also the copy number that you can control. Uh, and here you, uh, I will show you how it actually works. This is the um, picture from the original publication from, uh, by uh, Kaneyama and others. Uh, you see that uh, two LOX sites are integrated into genomic DNA and uh, this, uh, let's assume this, this is a hot spot uh, with high transcriptional activity. And then uh, this cells are uh, transfected with um, uh, a plasmid carrying uh, a target gene. And uh, it's flanked with uh, two lock sites, ready, lock sites ready to recombine with the ones that are present in your genomic DNA and one lock site that will be used for the next round of recombination. Uh, in the result, you get a uh, plasmid, uh, sorry, you, you get uh, an insert in which the transgene is flanked, uh, still flanked, but by two lock sites, but one of them is rendered in, uh, inactive. So as a result, the next step of recombination will take place only at these two sites that are left. Uh, you take the transgene number two, uh, it's flanked with, again, with uh, uh, lock speed sites that are ready to combine with the ones that are left in your uh, genome. Uh, again, they have mutated arms uh, to render one of the sites uh, inactive. And as a result, you see that you get a, um, an inserted uh, two transgenes into uh, the genomic DNA with uh, a possibility to insert more. And you can easily imagine that these transgenes are, for example, a uh, light chain and heavy chain cassette. Uh, that are inserted, and you can actually control the number of light chain and uh, heavy chain passes that you want to have in uh, your cell line. Uh, this approach has been shown um, uh, quite effective, and here you can see uh, they demonstrated uh, the generation of recombinant CHO cell that produce a single chain antibody fragment that is used with the FC region. Uh, of IgG and the cumulative uh, productivities for each cell lines, expressing one 
um, fragment was, uh, or one uh, introduced gene uh, was uh, 20 uh, uh, picograms per cell per day with two copies, it was 29, and with three copies, it was 40 picograms per cell per day. So you can see actually how by uh, um, intended increase of copy number uh, of your genes in the genome, you can increase the uh, amount of protein that is uh, expressed by your system. In our lab, we also adjusted the uh, three recombinase based RNC, RNC approach uh, to our vector assembly platform. And um, uh, we wanted to, um, we actually uh, adjusted it for the expression of uh, fluorescent protein first, just to uh, easily um, quantify the system. And here you can see this is a mock transfection. Uh, with no uh, expression vector. Uh, this is transfection with a, a vector expressing uh, CYOP protein. And this is actually the stable cell pool that carries uh, GFP uh, expressing plasmid. And uh, this cell pool was used to be, uh, well, in, in, in this case, GFP was flanked with uh, uh, a set of block sites and here uh, are the results that show that uh, after uh, co-transfection uh, of this uh, of these cells with uh, CYOP expressing plasmid with uh, lock signs that are uh, able to recombine with the ones that are uh, present in the GFP cassette and with uh, pre recombinase uh, mRNA uh, in which transcribed. Uh, before the experiment, uh, we uh, see that uh, we obtained actually a pool of GFP expressing cells on, on the day nine, a pool of uh, double positives and a pool of uh, CYOP expressing cells, which uh, is 7%. Uh, of cells. And we can speculate, of course, on uh, this, how uh, this came out to be and what the uh, double positives are and whether they are uh, just a result of um, integration of CIOP vector in another spot. So not due to the recombination or it's a result of uh, the presence of more than one uh, GFP cassette in the uh, genome. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, this shows that we obtained actually the, uh, the, the recombinized work and we obtained the uh, cells that carried only CIOP uh, in their genome. Uh, so uh, the last part is uh, targeted integration uh, that is nuclease based. Um, it can be achieved by introducing site-specific DNA double-stranded breaks. Uh, and uh, of course, the methods that are used are sync fingers, uh, Talon, and CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, and speaking of uh, the difference between these methods, is the major uh, difference is in um, is that sync fingers and talent use actually the DNA binding motifs uh, that can be uh, modified to uh, specifically bind a certain uh, DNA uh, sequence in the genome. Uh, and in case of uh, CRISPR-Cas, it's the uh, guide RNA that directs Cas9 and the nuclease to bind and cleave a specific uh, sequence on the DNA. Uh, all of these uh, methods um, are based on uh, double-stranded break uh, repair mechanisms that are uh, used by the cells, uh, and they can be there can be two major pathways: the uh, non-homologous end uh, joining and homologous um, uh, homology-directed uh, repair. Uh, briefly, uh, the HCR uses several hundreds of um, uh, homology 
nucleotides on each side of the um, target sequence. Uh, and these sites actually have to be introduced into uh, 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 on both sides of your uh, gene of interest that you would like to knock in uh, in order to perform uh, the reaction. Uh, unfortunately, the HDR mediated gene of modification is known to be quite low. And uh, actually, this is a question about uh, modifying, uh, about introducing genes by uh, CRISPR-Cas, because uh, there are methods that are used uh, apart from HDR. Uh, mediated um, integration, they can use uh, microhomology uh, and joining, or uh, there is also um, homology independent targeted integration that uh, is actually based on um, cutting the uh, transgene from the donor vector and uh, inserting it um, into the uh, host genome by uh, the Cas nuclease itself. Uh, this method uh, is shown to be more efficient than that, uh, canonical HDR. Uh, however, uh, all these methods have a great potential, but they also uh, need a lot of efforts to be put into optimization of the system. But this makes them even more interesting because when they are optimized, this they are great tools for uh, cell line engineering, uh, whether you want to um, insert a certain gene to uh, ensure its proper and high uh, expression, or if you want to uh, introduce some metabolic uh, changes, for example, into your cell line. Well, <laughs> a lot of words. Uh, so what to take away from uh, this lecture? I uh, really hope that the experience I shared uh, would be uh, useful for someone who is interested in protein production. Uh, you can see that vector engineering plays an important role in improving the, uh, the component protein yields. And uh, still, this is a major part of uh, uh, expression system optimization when you work with uh, um, protein expression. Uh, so first thing, don't forget to check for COSAC sequence, whether you have it or you have it the right one. Uh, then control the monoclonal antibody light chain and heavy chain uh, expression levels and uh, the LCHC ratio as this is important. And this can be done with uh, promoters and iris elements. Uh, signal peptides optimization is necessary for each individual protein product. This is important always. Uh, selection is highly dependent on the uh, selection marker that you are using and stringency of selection is uh, a parameter that you also can influence. Uh, think of uh, incorporating chromatin modifying elements uh, to improve expression. And uh, remember that functional modules always work in tandem. Uh, it, it's not only about having the top uh, active promoter. Yes, it's about its combination with all other parts of the uh, expression vector. Uh, and about in targeted integration. Uh, transposon mediated insertions increase the gene copy number. So use it uh, when you want uh, more of your genome to be introduced. Uh, and they, uh, this targets uh, your gene of interest into transcriptionally active sites. Uh, Hotspots can be targeted by uh, the combinase mediated cassette exchange, and there uh, you can really control the number of genes that you are inserting in the site that you're interested in. 
Uh, and also look into uh, targeted transgene integration with CRISPR-Cas. Uh, I think this is uh, the field that is going to be more and more uh, de developed uh, in the nearest future. And the last one, uh, nothing is impossible. So whenever you get stuck, just look for another path and definitely there is one. Thank you. And I... Um, Ready for your questions. Thank you very much, Natalia. And please, dear participants, do you have any questions? Now we have one question in chat. Uh, so, Natalia, is there in biotech any idea of using CRISP or CRASR for introducing GOI or GOI, or we can use it only for local modification of DNA. Uh, I'm sorry, the last part of the question, we can use it for what? Only for local modification of DNA. Um, um, well, uh, that, that's actually what I was talking about, uh, yes. There are publications that show that you can use uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, precisely to introduce a gene of interest into some specific spot in the genome. Uh, for example, it can be um, the, the um, safe harbor spots. Uh, some safe harbor spots are known already. Uh, and you can insert your gene of interest exactly in that spot. Or you can uh, perform some um, uh, transcription, uh, transcriptomics analysis, for instance, and uh, define which uh, parts, which genes are uh, highest expressive, see where they are located and uh, use uh, those genomic sequences to introduce your gene of interest exactly in that spot to enable uh, high transcription levels. Uh, yes, that's done, uh, that can be done with CRISPR-Cas. Mm, thank you. And another question is, what prospects or does your research have for genetic modification technologies? <laughs> well, uh, uh, everything I'm talking about is actually uh, for um, our in-house uh, expression system optimization, because uh, we're working on monoclonal antibodies production. Uh, and, well, development and production. And uh, the first question that you have when you start uh, expressing a protein, yeah, you have to optimize every stage to obtain the uh, highest amount that uh, are suitable for industrial uh, production. So everything that we are doing at this point is optimizing the system to obtain the, the productivities uh, that we, we will think are uh, enough for um, production. Um, actually, this is done whenever uh, anyone wants to uh, produce therapeutic uh, recombinant proteins, because uh, when you are talking about not lab scale, but uh, production scale, uh, every single point in uh, uh, the process can be optimized to, to obtain the levels that are suitable for production. Thank you. One more question. Uh, can people with genetic diseases be cured uh, thanks to your discovery? Uh, this is not really the, um, the aim that we have. Uh, because uh, I'm, I'm really now talking about uh, uh, producing uh, therapeutic proteins, right? It's, it's not gene therapy. Uh, although uh, recombinant proteins are used as a replacement therapy, can be used as a replacement therapy, or uh, people with inherited uh, disorders, uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis are treated with uh, monoclonal antibodies, right? So uh, uh, therapeutic proteins are not used to uh, treat the genetic disorders, but uh, they are used to help people who 
uh, who have some inherited diseases. And speaking of the um, methods that we are using, uh, well, uh, the RMC method allows the cell line um, uh, cell line engineering. So this is not about uh, treating disorders. Uh, speaking of CRISPR-Cas, uh, well, you all know that uh, there are approaches that there are um, uh, labs working on uh, uh, different application of CRISPR-Cas for uh, engineering uh, genomes to avoid some genetic disorders, but this is not the uh, the aim that we have in our lab. Mm, thank you. Uh, one more question. What right conditional we need to achieve to edit DNA easily? What right conditional we need to achieve to edit DNA easily? Dmitry <laughs> asked. I don't really understand the question, actually. Um, well, the, the, the condition... Dmitry, maybe you can specify your question, please. Uh, what temperature we need to achieve uh, uh, to make oh. operations more quickly, warp presence and so on. Maybe some uh, level of light we need to have uh, <laughs> something. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in these questions. Uh, well, it also can be informing because in every stage it will be different. Um, it, I, I just really don't know how to answer your question because I don't know where to start off, uh, what, what conditions. For, for each experiment there is its own condition. Uh, in your experiments, And they are very different. I mean, well, <laughs> I, I need some specification. Uh, different. Uh, uh, every single experiment will uh, um, need optimal conditions, depending on the first. If you're talking about uh, the actual protein production, it's, it's about the process characteristics optimization. It's about the um, cell line that you're using. It's about the media that you're using. It's the, the um, uh, well, everything. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank and you. Uh, Natalia. Maybe you can ask, um, oh, sorry, ask, answer. What drugs uh, have already been developed using this uh, technology? Or is just a theoretical technology in your lab? Uh, well, uh, I'm not able to answer this question, unfortunately. It's, uh, uh, it's a com commercial uh, secret. <laughs> Oh, so I'm, I can, uh, I'm yeah. maybe some drugs we already can buy. Uh, no, 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 unfortunately, no. no. Uh, this is just uh, we work at the development mm -hmm. stage. What? So uh, all, all biotechnology drugs that we are working on are uh, at the stage of preclinical discovery. They are not in the clinic mm -hmm. or on the market yet. I understood. Okay, and what line of mice do you use? Lines or lines? Uh, uh, we don't use mice. <laughs> we use oh, no? uh, the Ch Chinese hamster ovary cell line. Ah, okay. Ah, it was a, a information about mice, and I thought it maybe <laughs> we use mice instead of hamster. <laughs> no, no, it, 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 it's the Chinese hamster ovary cell line. Ah, okay. And what uh, uh, software do you use for your research? The main software, maybe? Well, one of huh. them. Uh, uh, again, it depends on what, uh, le uh, what stage of research you're, mm -hmm. you're talking about, and is it only about the software? Uh, if we talk about uh, vector engineering, it's just simple snap gene. Uh, that we're using, not nothing special. Um, 
all the vectors are manually uh, assembled first uh, in this uh, uh, software. Uh, so you actually look at the sequences with your own eyes and see where there is the uh, coning site, where there is uh, the overhang, which parts of the um, sequences are present and so on. This just lets you to put them all together, that's all. Okay, thank you. So dear participants, that's all questions or maybe you have another question for Natalia? Oh, no, I think that it were all questions. So, Natalia, thank you very much for your interesting and actual lecture. A lot of information and deep answers. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting and um, enjoy the rest of the summer school. Thank you. See you next time, I hope. Hopefully. Enjoy. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye.